Hi guys, iPhone Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start at the very least on my review of 2061 Odyssey 3 by Arthur C. Clarke. So as always, I'm going to read you the blurb, I'm going to go through and check out my tabs, and we'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end, so... Dane reads... 2001 A Space Odyssey was the classic story that told of man's destiny in space. 2010 Odyssey 2 pushed back the frontiers of human imagination still further. Now, 2061 Odyssey 3 tells of humanity's evolution towards the stars. In 2061, when two suns share the skies of Earth, Halley's Comet returns to the inner solar system. Soon the fates of two spacefaring expeditions are entwined by human necessity and then the immutable laws of astrophysics. Centenarian Haywood Floyd must once again confront Dave Bowman, a newly independent HAL, and the limitless power of an alien race that has decided humanity must play a part in the evolution of the galaxy, whether it wants to or not. 2061 Odyssey 3 takes the century's greatest story onto brilliant new dimensions of wonder and excitement. This is visionary storytelling at its compelling, mind-expanding best. So, let's go in. Uh, we'll start actually with the introduction here. Uh, to the memory of Judy Lynn Del Rey, editor extraordinary, who bought this book for $1 but never knew if she got her money's worth. Uh, I assume that's who Del Rey Publishing is named after. So, following up from the end of the last book, um, Dr. Chandra he's no longer with them uh, he, he's dead and I really like this little bit somewhere beyond Mars so imperceptibly that the monitors could not pinpoint the time he'd simply ceased to live his body set adrift in space had continued unchecked along Leonov's orbit and had long since been consumed by the fires of the sun the cause of death was totally unknown but Max Brolovsky expressed a view that highly unscientific though it was not even Surgeon Commander Kate Katerina Rodenko attempted to refute he couldn't live without how uh, because Chandra being the creator of HAL. You get reference to the historical abolition of long distance charges on the 31st of December 2000. Every telephone call became a local one and the human race greeted the new millennium by transforming itself into one huge gossiping family. Well, I don't know if that necessarily happened, but I suppose, you know, we did have the internet and VOIP. Uh, this was published in paperback in 1989. First published in Britain in 1988, so just before the invention of the World Wide Web. There's references to like war between the US and Russia. Um, the second nuclear war saw the use in combat of no more bombs than the first, precisely two. And though the killer tonnage was greater, the casualties were far fewer, as both were used against sparsely populated oil installations. Someone notes that at any given moment there were 100,000 Russian tourists in the United States and half a million Americans in the Soviet Union, most of them engaged in their traditional pastime of complaining about the plumbing. Great start to chapter six. Rolf van der Berg was the right man in the right place at the right time. No other combination would have worked, which of course is how much of history is made. Uh, we get a reference to Haywood Floyd has got this line of poetry in his head. I too take leave of all I ever had. Um, and it says, um, without further clues, it might take the station computer quite a while, as much as 10 minutes to locate the line in the whole body of English literature. That, that would not happen, you know, you just punch it into Google. We get this great, um, res great this, this great to and fro. Uh, although it is ruined by an adverb, it was ruined by the word teasingly here. But haven't you ever thought of divorce? He had once asked them teasingly. Divorce never was his swift reply. Murder often. Just a shame about that teasingly. I think this is quite cool. Just some sort of world building and some of the technological stuff about how this spaceship works. The biggest surprise, even though the advanced literature should have prepared him for it, was the presence of gravity. Universe was the first spaceship ever built to cruise under continuous acceleration, except for the few hours of the mid-course turnaround. When her huge propellant tanks were fully loaded with their 5,000 tons of water, she could manage a tenth of a G. Not much, but enough to keep loose objects from drifting around. This was particularly convenient at meal times, though it took a few days for the passengers to learn not to stir their soup too vigorously. So I thought this was really cool. There's a swimming pool in a spaceship. And so we get, is there a diving board? I used to be a college champion. As a matter of fact, yes, it's only five meters, but that will give you three seconds of free fall at our nominal 10th of a G. And if you want a longer time, I'm sure Mr. Curtis will be happy to reduce thrust. Indeed, said the chief engineer dryly, and mess up all my orbit calculations, not to mention the risk of the water crawling out, surface tension, you know. Wasn't there a space station once that had a spherical swimming pool, somebody asked. They tried it at the hub of Pasteur before they started the spin, answered Floyd. It just wasn't practical. In zero gravity, it had to be completely enclosed, and you could drown rather easily inside a big sphere of water if you panicked. One way of getting into the record books, first person to drown in space. I suppose it would be, wouldn't it? 
I like this as well, this beginning of chapter 14. It is a good principle in science not to believe any fact, however well attested, until it fits into some accepted frame of reference. Occasionally, of course, an observation can shatter the frame and force the construction of a new one, but that is extremely rare. Galileo's and Einstein's seldom appeared more than once per century, which is just as well for the equanimity of mankind. Oh, and we get a reference to the Beatles and their psychedelic fantasies, which I like as a Beatles fan. So uh, Haywood Floyd ends up on uh, Halley's Comet, and we get this, which I thought was very cool. He brought up his arms and launched the snowball towards the stars. It was so small and so dark that it vanished almost at once, but he kept on staring into the sky. And then abruptly, unexpectedly, it appeared in a sudden explosion of light as it rose into the rays of the hidden sun. Black as soot though it was, it reflected enough of that blinding brilliance to be easily visible against the faintly luminous sky. Floyd watched it until it finally disappeared, perhaps by evaporation, perhaps by dwindling into the distance. It would not last long in the fierce torrent of radiation overhead, but how many men could claim to have created a comet of their own. Very cool. And Dr. Chan ends up inside um, and there's a, a joke that like cave explorers all want to return to the womb and uh, he, he could refute them. He said that must be a damn noisy place with all its thumping and bumping and gurgling. I love caves because they're so peaceful and timeless. We get a reference to Star Wars movies. It's said that while he's exploring uh, Halley's Comet, the interior, it's like um, when the Millennium Falcon runs into the gigantic snake creature that lurks inside the caverns of the asteroid. Um, and we get, I always wondered how that poor beast managed to eke out a living. It must have grown very hungry, waiting for the occasional tidbit from space. And Princess Leia wouldn't have been more than an hors d'oeuvre anyway. And this is just an amazing line. Though there have been shameful exceptions, few massacres occur on camera. We get a reference to, basically they're not sure what to do about Europa because they're not supposed to go there. Um, the World Council gives them permission to drop some um, like scientific hardware down onto it. And we get, personally I'm quite surprised the World Council gave me permission. Dr. Anderson was also a little surprised, though he might not have been had he known that the project was the last item on a long agenda of a science subcommittee late on a Friday afternoon. Of such trifles, history is made. That's a very human thing as well. It reminds me of there was a study that found that you're more likely to be um, like set free or get a lesser sentence from judges if you get them, I think it was just after lunch when they've eaten because they're in a happier mood. This line here was a bit dodgy. Um, Sorry to be late, sir, said Rose McCullen. One would never guess from her name that she was slightly darker than the coffee she was carrying. Not really necessary, you know. We get reference to party silences where everyone waits simultaneously for someone else to speak. Um, I've not heard that term before, but I know exactly what they're talking about, so I thought that was quite cool. Okay, so Universe gets a shortcut from getting a boost from the sun's gravitational field and we get Because nature always balances her books, the sun lost some velocity in the transaction, but the effect would not be measurable for a few thousand years. I feel like I've read that line before, I was getting like huge deja vu from it. And Maggie M, she says, Writers are always saying what a lot of work they could do if they were only in some place with no interruptions, no engagements. Lighthouses and prisons are their favourite examples. So it's up at page 207, Captain Smith of this uh, spaceship, he, he's, he's informed that his, uh, he has the same name as the captain of the Titanic, which is done as like a big reveal at the end of the chapter, but I'd noticed ages ago and, and hadn't thought it worth mentioning. But yeah, I think, it's, I think it was Edward Smith? Uh, hey Google, who was Captain Edward Smith? He came from near me. Uh, we get a reference as well. Um, but I, I think that Mercury is going to be like the moon. Remember, we landed there in 1969 and didn't go back again for half a lifetime. Anyway, Mercury isn't as useful as the moon, though perhaps one day it might be. And that does kind of check track with real life. Um, obviously, this was written a good while ago. I think it was written, what was it, 88? Was it written? Published, uh, first published in 88, yeah. Um, and obviously, we're really only going back to the moon properly now. Um, and that's because we want to use it as a base to, to go to Mars. Because it's easier to launch uh, an inter interplanetary flight from the moon, because the moon doesn't have an atmosphere. So the idea is we'll go from the Earth to the moon, then from the moon to Mars. A bit like, I don't know, stopping at a service station on the way or something. We get references to uh, earthquakes of Tokyo 33 and Los Angeles 45, which obviously is in the future. But it wouldn't surprise me, I mean, Clark knows his stuff, you know, and he knows that those locations are both particularly prone to earthquakes and probably due them. So this uh, bit here is quite interesting because they compare themselves with the explorers of old. 
Um, yes, we're infinitely better off than any of those old time explorers. It's almost impossible to believe that until well into the last century they were completely cut off from the rest of the human race once they'd gone over the horizon. We should be ashamed at grumbling because light isn't fast enough and we can't talk to our friends in real time, or that it takes a couple of hours to get replies from Earth. They had no contact for months, almost years. We learn that uh, Mount Zeus, which is this big mountain um, they've discovered on, where, where's it? Europa, I guess. Uh, it's a single diamond, approximate mass 1 million tons, or if you prefer it that way, about 2 times 10 to the 17th carats. Um, which is kind of hinted at earlier, or at least I guessed it, but I don't feel as though it's any great deduction. Somebody knew there was something going on with this mountain, they wanted to keep it secret, so I figured it was probably going to be some sort of diamond. Uh, so they name, they nickname it Lucy, and um, Floyd goes, oh by the way, who is Lucy? Anybody in particular? Not as far as I know. We came across her in a computer search and decided the name would make a good code word. Everyone would assume it was something to do with Lucifer, the new star, which is just enough of a half-truth to be beautifully misleading. I'd never heard of them, but a hundred years ago there was a group of popular musicians with a very strange name. The Beatles, spelled B-E-A-T-L-E-S, don't ask me why. And they wrote a song with an equally strange title, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Weird, isn't it? Almost as if they knew. Um, that was actually inspired by a drawing that Julian Lennon, John Lennon's son, did. Um, but I find it hard to believe that in a hundred years time no one will have heard of the Beatles. And then um, there's this great quote here. When I was studying at Flagstaff, began Van der Berg, I came across an old astronomy book that said the solar system consists of the sun, Jupiter and assorted debris. Puts Earth in its place, doesn't it? And hardly fair to Saturn, Uranus and Neptune, the other three gas giants come to almost half as much as Jupiter. So yes. 2061 Odyssey 3, probably Odyssey 2 was my favourite of the lot to be honest, Odyssey 3 not far behind it. I'd give this a weak 4 out of 5, um, I did enjoy the kind of culmination of this series and um, yeah if you're a science fiction fan you're probably going to want to read the trilogy. Um, don't just stop with 2001 A Space Odyssey because I personally thought that was the weakest of the three and uh, yeah I did enjoy it, I'm looking forward to reading some more Arthur C. Clarke. So there we have it, that's what I made of 2061 Odyssey 3. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.